Hey, what's going on guys? It's Jack. Back again to bring you my guide to Brackenhide Hollow. This dungeon has a couple of different options for how you can route through it, and certainly later on we're going to go over more advanced skips, but for now we're going to talk about it as if you're going to just press W through the entire dungeon. There's a few different areas at the very beginning of the dungeon you have to watch out for when it comes to some difficult trash mobs, but in general the beginning of the dungeon is about the best way to be able to get lots of trash percentage so that you can either walk around some mobs or use invis pots and things later if you have access to them. Uh, also, Mind Sooth is incredibly good in this dungeon, allowing your priest to be able to Mind Sooth the targets and also fade themselves to get really close and open up some of the cages. So at the beginning, you have to open up five cages before you're able to have access to the first boss. And I generally recommend if you have like Mind Sooth or Shroud skips to get around 30% in terms of trash, or sorry, around 40% of trash percentage by the time that you encounter the first boss. If you do not, get around 30% and you'll be just fine pressing W throughout. Some of the difficult mobs at the start are the Decay Speakers. They summon a like Rot Totem that targets one of your allies, cast a disease on them. You can just dispel, it's not a problem. It's always really good to make sure you have multiple disease dispels and poison dispels, but we're going to try to skip some of the poisons that we'll encounter later on in the dungeon. And it's really good to be able to have the Soothe because the War Scourge mobs will cast a Bladestorm that you can Soothe to stop. And they have a cackle sort of fear cast that just needs to be interrupted. When it comes to some of the mystics that are at the start of the dungeon, they just kind of cast little single target nukes, almost like cinder bolts, onto your allies. Just kick them when you can, but they're not as big of a priority. The first boss is a council fight. Trick Totem will try to cast these heals onto herself that can be purged, but they also are able to be interrupted. Gash Tooth at the very start of the encounter is going to cast multiple bleeds on the entire party, and they're kind of like Grievous where you need to be able to heal them up to full to be able to remove. So make sure if you have Ancestral Guidance, Vigil, Vamp, any off-healing, things like that, large defensives as well, they should be used on the pull, and the, the bosses will cast it again about a minute, minute and a half into the encounter. So make sure you have defensives or just large healing on cool available for when the ability comes off cooldown for the boss. Hack Claw, just like the War Scourges, is going to cast a Blade Storm. And then the Gash Tooth is also going to fixate one target and then just start slamming damage into him pretty shortly after he does his Grievous attack. So it's really important you top everybody off really quickly. Then use like Pain Suppression or Barrier, Guardian Spirit, any other external Iron Barks on whoever is going to be fixated at that point. The tank damage is usually not too high in this one, so feel free to fully send those defensives and externals onto whoever is getting fixated. A lot of times the deaths on this encounter are going to come from Bladestorm and people not being ready for the Bladestorm. If you give that the proper respect, you're going to have a considerably easier time. Trick Totem, about 40 seconds into the fight or so, is going to spawn a Totem, which will hex the healer, and then Gash or the Gash Tooth is going to then blind the tank. And at the same time, Hack Claw is going to target somebody for 10 seconds or so and then try to charge into them. What your party needs to do in this point is kill the totem. The healer then needs to dispel the tank. And then the tank needs to soak the frontal or the charge that's going to be coming out of Hack Claw. If you do all three of these things, then you should continue focusing down Trick Totem. And then the bosses are going to enrage at around 10% when one of them reaches about 10% and then you'll be able to kill off the rest. So there's going to be that combination of totem, tank to spell, and then the charge, and then Gash Tooth is going to bleed everyone right afterwards. So there's really just this crucial part of the fight that you need to be able to get through, you need to be able to overcome, and then it should go down without an issue. Once you kill off the first boss, it's really important to go to the right. Do not go to the left side. Going to the left side has stalker mobs, which you might have to encounter one or two of them with the route we're going to be doing. They also have a lot of rogues that are going to be all over the place. And the rogues will sort of shadow step to a target and then apply a poison to them, which deals massive damage and it reduces their haste. So you want to avoid as many of these as you possibly can, because even if you have all the poison dispels in the world, there are a lot of these guys and you'll eventually have to deal with, with some of them if you choose to go to the left side. So go to the right and hug the right side of the right alleyway, basically, so you can avoid as many of the Rot Singer enemies as possible. These Rot Singers are going to spawn a totem just like at the start of the dungeon, but instead of targeting one person, it afflicts everybody in the party with diseases, reducing your haste, stacking additional damage, and it's just a nightmare to deal with. If you're able to pool up damage to kill these totems off, great, but they can be pretty hard to target swap to for most people, so the more you can do to just avoid these mobs entirely, the better. 
the Wilted Oaks are going to cast these like Breath Frontals that can be interrupted and also just faced away. And there's going to be a lot of Lashers and a lot of small mobs throughout this dungeon. But keep in mind, they're pretty much like funnel targets. They kind of just stack up some bleeds on players, especially if you're able to get everybody pretty close together and kind of spread the bleeds around. It shouldn't be too much of a problem. Once you get through that trash, you're going to be up to Tree Mouth. Tree Mouth is going to suck in players with his Grasping Vines, and he must always consume one player, otherwise he gets a massive damage buff. Once he consumes that player, he gains a shield. You need to deal damage to that shield to break the consumed player out, and that player can then not be consumed again, unless they're going to take like 500% more damage or some crazy stuff like that. So what we did is we had the tank get soaked first, then we had either an immunity class or a tanky class. I used pain stuff on them if I really needed it, and then goes back to the tank once again. There's not that much extra damage going on in this boss fight, and it'll go down pretty easily once you focus all the adds down and kill him off. After Tree Mouth, you have Stink Breath, who's on this bridge. Uh, he can be skipped with Mind Soothe, Warlock Gateway, Shroud, I believe as well, if you can. If not, just make sure you're not stacked. He's gonna target one player and sort of breathe on them, and everybody near him will also get disoriented. The problem is it can also happen to the tank, and other mobs you can pull in with it are like rogues that will cast more poisons. So there's a lot of just nasty stuff here, and you wanna skip him if you possibly can. But if not, you might wanna just have to kill him alone. Once you get across that bridge, you need to go to the right and again, hug the right side. There's once again, rogues, stalkers, all these other garbage mobs, which are a lot more likely to wipe you. And it's so much easier just to skip them entirely. So you're gonna go over this nice hill, through the bushes and try to skip again as much as you can. You might have to pull this stalker that is surrounded by hy hyenas. You absolutely wanna make sure you're focusing down that stalker as best you can, because what the stalker mobs do is they will cast these bone bleeds on everybody in your party. See the theme we have going on? They are incredibly high damage and they're just not that efficient to be able to kill off. The stalker is also gonna cast this rotting meat onto a player, which if there's any hyenas nearby, will cause the hyenas to chase after that guy and fixate him. And even if there isn't, that rotting food just deals incredible amounts of damage to that individual target. So. Keep that in mind and try to skip it if at all possible. Moving on to the gut shot boss. She is gonna be spawning with a number of hyenas. If they are ever rooted in her traps, and that's ideal, they take a little bit of damage, but they also are instantly gonna hit anybody who's in melee range of them. So keep in mind that the tank needs to be in melee range of them if you want if you have multiple melee in your group and you want to kill them quickly. Make sure your tank is in range of them so he's getting hit instead of them. And the boss, just like the stalkers, is going to cast this rotting meat onto a player, dealing a good amount of damage and causing the hyenas to fixate onto them. Once again, you're going to see all the arrows from the hyenas fixating onto the target. Once they get rooted, however, they will hit anybody within melee range. So it's a really easy boss fight for somebody to sort of randomly die. If a hyena gets fixated, gets rooted, and somebody else is in range of them, they'll just double tap them and kill them very quickly. The hyenas can either spawn at the bridge that you walked in on or in the cave at the back of the room. So make sure that you are placing traps around those areas. But again, it's not super heavily dependent on that encounter. Just make sure you're staying away from the hyenas and you'll be having a good time. Gut Shot's also gonna knock back your tank, so make sure your tank doesn't get knocked off the cliff. This final area has a number of different opportunities to skip, and it's also really valuable for Mind Soothe, not to mention really valuable for having Shroud. The War Scourges can see through stealth, so being able to have the combination of both is very helpful. But again, you ideally want to be able to skip a lot of this end area, even though it's very rich in trash percentage. Uh, there's a very, very challenging pull with Rot Hexers. These guys are going to cast diseases on players and then try to suck them up and buff themselves in the process. It also deals an incredible amount of single target damage to these guys, so it's imperative that when a disease is placed onto an ally, they are instantly dispelled as fast as they can so you can prevent the follow-up damage burst and the buff onto those Rot Hexers. There's a lot of little biters, which work similarly to the Lasher mobs, where they just kind of place around a bunch of little diseases, and otherwise, they're not too terribly deadly. While this 4 Rot Hexer pull is extremely efficient when it comes to trash percentage, it's also one of these, if you run out of kicks, or you run out of dispels, you could die extremely quickly. So, you could do this with like Bloodlust, for example, if you didn't want to lust onto the last boss, it probably would be a good Bloodlust pull on a Fortified Week, but it can also be kind of a risky pull, so if you have enough trash percentage, you can also just skip around. At the end, you do have to kill off a couple of these like little Witherlings and an individual Rod Hexer. Having one of them, not too big of a deal to fight and kill off, but having four of them is certainly very deadly. 
The Decatriarch, the final boss, you must kill this totem every single time. The totem that she spawns is going to put dots on everybody in the party and a 5% damage down, which again makes it harder to kill future totems. Uh, the boss is going to have stacks of a damage buff onto herself that are removed by successive successful melee strikes, which means that some block heavy or, so, or sorry, some dodge heavy tanks like Brew might take a really long time to have the stacks be removed. Once the stacks are removed, she gains energy. And when she reaches full energy, she will suck up any of the damage downs that are on players, removing the dots from them, but also buffing herself. She casts a pretty mighty negative heal absorb onto the tank and deals a lot of damage there, and also has a frontal that the tank needs to aim away. And so you kind of oscillate between heavy party damage if you're letting any of the totem casts go off, and then she removes them, buffs herself, and then could almost kill the tank outright with how many damage buffs that she receives. So keep that in mind, that pooling up damage, even as a healer, especially as a healer, is going to be absolutely imperative to making sure you're reducing the amount of damage going out onto your party. It's one of these fights that you just cannot let snowball out of control, and everybody, even if they suck at switching targets, needs to do whatever is possible to kill off these totems. If you have certain classes like monks who have touched death it's great to be able to communicate as to when you're going to be able to cast that touch of death and destroy the totem quickly but again this is a very very snowbally encounter which can get out of control very quickly if you're not attributing enough damage to these totems so make sure you keep an eye on that thanks so much for watching if you enjoyed this guide make sure to subscribe and check out the patreon if you want to keep on supporting as we do have a growing patreon big thank you to sebastian me club watney nick potato banana ranger mankin milo zach julie steph cecilio thoreaker fourth crow elif caldoran kevro simon merle and john for getting us going thank you so much for watching guys hope you all enjoyed it and i'll catch you all next time